Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Director Swami Vivekan and Kashi Center, Dr. Koju Sutu, Mrs. Ragini Haribai, Ms. Paula Martini, Ms. Kavita Solanki, Ms. Shisti Harinarayan, and Mr. Piyush Kandawal, distinguished online guests. On behalf of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Consulate General of India in Durban, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to today's program, Invocation of External Light to commemorate Buddha Purnima. A Buddha's birthday is a Buddhist festival and holiday celebrated in most of East Asia, commemorating the birth of Prince Siddhartha Gautama, later the Gautama Buddha and founder of Buddhism. In South and Southeast Asia, it is celebrated and it places greater emphasis on the enlightenment and death of the Buddha. Buddha was an influential spiritual teacher during and even after his lifetime. Many Buddhas see him as a supreme Buddha. Festivals to honor Buddha were held for many centuries, celebrated with great faith and devotion. There is a deep significance of Buddha Purnima. Buddhism encourages its people to avoid self-indulgence, but also self-denial. Buddha's most important teachings, known as the Four Noble Truths, are essential to understanding the religion. Buddhists embrace the concepts of karma, the law of cause and effect, and reincarnation, known as the continuous cycle of rebirth. To begin today's program, I would like to introduce our very first guest speaker, Mrs. Ragini Haribai from the Sri Shraddha Devi Ashram. Mrs. Haribai is a long-standing devotee and board member of the Sri Shatta Devi Ashram. She actively participates in many of the ashram's <laughs> activities. Mrs. Ragini Haribai. My salutations <laughs> at the Lotus Feet. <laughs> Respected Dr. Yogi, Dr. Satu, Ms. Paula Martini, Vita G and Program Director. Namaskar. Buddha is a spiritually awakened or enlightened state. Buddha's final message, be a lamp unto yourself. Buddha is not a person. It is a state. I have opened the door. Enter, all of you, is a significant framework from which to understand his life and teachings. Swami Vivekananda, who had an innate love for Buddha, said, All my life I have been very fond of Buddha. I have more veneration for that character than any other. That boldness, that fearlessness, and that tremendous love. He was born for the good of humanity. Some seek God, others seek truth. He did not even care to know truth for himself. He sought truth because people were in misery. How to help them? That was his only concern. Throughout his life, he never had a thought for himself." End quote. As we journey through Buddha's life, we endeavor to understand how his teachings codified into the Four Noble Truths including the Eightfold Path, which can further be condensed into ethical conduct, mental discipline, and wisdom, can be harmonized in our lives to enable us to reach enlightenment. Buddha, named Siddhartha at birth, was a prince of the Sakya clan. He was extraordinarily beautiful, and it is said that peace engulfed the world when he was born. As is the customary practice in Eastern traditions, his father engaged astrologers to determine the prince's future. The prediction was that Siddhartha would become a great emperor, or, on seeing the suffering in the world, a great ascetic. To steer his son's mind away from asceticism, the king created a utopian environment for the prince, where 
everyone was happy and healthy. Siddharth lived a comfortable, protected existence with no knowledge or experience of suffering. He was extremely intelligent and naturally meditative. So with the studies of the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita enhanced this deeply reflective nature. When he eventually ventured into the city, he encountered three sites that would, in fact, that would affect him deeply, those of old age, illness, and death. These optics made him aware of the reality of human suffering, fronted by the blissful, serene face of an ascetic, was a contrast. These experiences made Siddharth pause and reflect. We must understand that Buddha saw homelessness, hunger, and poverty. He understood that these sufferings could be alleviated through socio-economic reforms. His pursuit was for a permanent solution to address the process of aging, illness, and death, which are sufferings intrinsically linked to human existence. Later, Buddha explained the nature of suffering to be like being hit by two arrows. The first arrow is what the world throws at us. This can be natural calamities, pandemics, personal tragedy, interpersonal relationships, and mind or body afflictions. The second arrow is the suffering that we experience because of the first arrow. The first arrow is common to everyone. The second arrow differs depending on how we react to the first arrow. Real suffering is due to the second arrow. Buddha explained that spirituality cannot remove the first arrow. But what enlightenment and spirituality can do is to remove the second arrow, which is our real inner suffering. Mindfulness lends to calmness. When we think calmly, then we can make correct decisions to prevent suffering. Buddha had a prosperous kingdom, a wife, a child, youth, good health, every imaginable luxury. Yet the blazing light of renunciation compelled him to relinquish all that he had in pursuit of a permanent resolution to suffering for the benefit of humanity. Right understanding, which denotes renunciation and attachment, is significant for progress in spiritual life. One must make sacrifices to achieve something higher, something better. Siddharth sacrificed his kingdom, his comforts, and his family in pursuit of enlightenment. Right concentration or determination has tremendous importance in spiritual and secular life. Multiple goals divide our energy. We can have intermediary goals, but we must define an ultimate goal. We achieve success if we garner our willpower and resolve. To seek a solution to suffering, Siddharth embarked on ascetic practices, which included penance and contemplation. As he intensified his austerities, he became extremely emaciated. Eventually, the insight that enlightenment would not be attained by torturing oneself dawned on him. Buddha understood that the search for the ultimate truth calls for the utmost stamina and courage, not the weakening of the body. Established in right thought, he ended his extreme austerity. One of the cardinal teachings of Buddhism is moderation. Buddha's first teaching was, quote, avoiding these two extremes, the middle road, bringing insight and knowledge leads to tranquility highest knowledge, full enlightenment to peace, end quote. Right effort implies determination. Siddharth sat under the Bodhi tree determined to attain peace, wisdom, and awakening. 
His determination has been immortalized in the Lalita Vestra, quote, let my body dry up on the seat, let my bones, muscles, and skin decay without attaining to illumination, which is difficult an achievement, even through eons, I shall not leave the seat, end quote. Buddha attained enlightenment or nirvana on a full moon night. Enlightenment is a state when one is free from suffering, anxiety, and disease. Buddha describes the state saying, I have attained that state which is called nirvana, where the breeze no longer sways the serenity, where night never sets, where illumination is constant, where truth is never eclipsed, where births and deaths are uprooted, and where treasures are never robbed. After a few weeks in this blissful state, Buddha decided to share his spiritual treasures with the world. It is significant to understand the prevalent practices during Buddha's lifetime. People focused on ritualistic worship, forgetting that the goal of life was to know who they really were. Currently, the world is facing the COVID-19 pandemic. We must act hastily to quench its exponential spread. Once we succeed, then we can philosophize. So Buddha also felt that finding an antidote to suffering without delay was essential. Buddha's first noble truth is that there is only suffering. This means that we are ignorant, hence the need for spiritual sensitivity. The second is that suffering is caused by desire and selfishness. Third, suffering can be conquered, not superficially by consuming healthy food or Botox to delay illness and aging, Enlightenment is the permanent solution to end suffering. Fourth, inculcating the Eightfold Path in our lives will bring freedom, peace, and illumination. Buddha distilled the teachings of the Upanishads, simplifying them for the masses. His reforms aimed at revitalizing religion, making it practical, strength-giving, and accessible to the masses. Enlightenment was not an exclusive possession, it was for all. He traveled throughout India, engaging with people in a dialect called Pali, a type of colloquial Sanskrit spoken at the time. People were thus better able to assimilate his teachings. Buddha encourages us to deepen our spiritual life by presenting the highest ideals to us. He emphasizes a morally perfect character and a pure heart. Right speech, action, and livelihood means truthfulness, honesty, speaking kindly, being tolerant, and earning a living ethically. Right action includes leading a life of selflessness, charity, non-violence, compassion, and kindness. We are indebted to Buddha who ruled the world with his spirituality, his compassion, and his noble ideas. He did not want to be worshipped or idolized. He intended that we imbibe the principles he experienced and taught. Buddha is an expression of sacrifice, of renunciation, of detachment and of love for all of creation. Buddha is awakening. Buddha is enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ragini Haribai, for sharing your knowledge with us. Our next guest speaker is Ms. From she's the creator of and owner of We Move Active. Ms. Paula Martini owns her very own business in the field of travel. Prior to running her successful travel business for the past 12 years, Ms. Paula Martini always believed that there was a bigger purpose to life.
raised Catholic by a Portuguese tradition, however never resonating with her, she embarked on many explorations of spirituality, knowing there was a purpose to life, including the belief that the institution of the church system, known to as many, was a more than a structural system rather than a system that embraced the light within each person and their contribution towards the higher self. Finding the practice of yoga and learning the tool of meditation, Ms. Paula Martini has been able to connect with her true self and develop her understanding of divinity, true being, and the amazing universe we live in. The basic understandings and teaching of Buddha have led her on a path that she relishes in each and every day to the meeting of others on a very similar journey of self-development. Ms. Paula Martini. Esteemed guests and everyone who's joined this very uniquely hosted celebration today. Namaskar. It's an absolute privilege that I get to address you all. Dr. Yogi and Cheryl, my heart is so full of gratitude to you both for not only today, but from the moment we met, for seeing the light within me. It's not often a person remembers moments in their childhood, especially one that goes as far back as your first years in schooling. There are two very particular moments I remember, as if they were yesterday. The memory of these events are so clear for a very special reason, I believe. The first being, great age six, grade one, impressionable, excited, meeting new friends and ready for a journey of learning ahead. Picture the scene, pigtails, checkered school dress, so big for you it's below the knees, brand new school shoes and socks so white they stood out glaring from the back of the shoes they were in. It's break, the bell rings and I bolt from the class. Once the passages are quiet, all have found their spots to tuck into their lunch boxes. I, meanwhile, am heading to the tallest of the school blocks, making my way to the top of the building, a copious amounts of stairs. At the top, I hold the balustrade and make my way backwards down the stairs, as if I were descending a mountain, one step at a time. Looking down, never up, one by one, and sometimes jumping every second. Why the story? Very simple. Possibly the idea of being a reincarnate of a person who might have ascended something as major as Mount Everest. Or possibly just the realization at that very moment, I knew I was going to be very different from others. To the first, very possibly. To the second, Absolutely. And in all honesty, it's knowing and embracing of it that makes this lifetime so amazing. Now the second, this is a goodie. Grade two, while everyone is listening so attentively to the teacher in class, being the unique individual I already then knew, I could not stop talking. After numerous attempts to silence me, the teacher becoming rather frustrated with me to the point where I was called to the front of the class and a piece of rather wide sticky tape was placed over my mouth. Extremely funny now, but at the time, horrified, ashamed and variably upset, naturally. For a seven-year-old, I was distraught and in tears. Why the story? Another simple explanation. It reminds me every single day that I have a voice. Already then, I used it. And throughout my schooling career, my mother would receive reports that although I had the potential to be a great student, my downfall, I simply just spoke too much. Well, I say, look where I am now. Over 26 years experience in the travel industry, two absolutely amazing teenage boys, and a business I've been running successfully for the past 12 years, of which at least eight have been growing entirely on my own. 
Even more amazing, however, is that I'm before you now, sharing this experience, knowledge, and my voice on this momentous occasion. The celebration, Buddha, Hunima, and, my sh and share my thoughts on the evocation of internal light. A lesson I have often tried to instill in my children, that although our current world requires us to conform to the norms, it's unconformity that sets us apart from the rest. The truth, it's what sets us apart, allowing us to shine and with pure light and intent. My journey from childhood right into adulthood always left me with a question. Who are we? Where are we from? What and where does everyone's belief system come from? With an absolute fascination with this, I began reading some books, looking inward to try and find the answer. Pondering this question left me with a fascination for Buddhism. Not being that well read, I struggled to find a book that I could relate to. Stumbling across a book called The Dalai Lama's Cat by David Michie, a novel about a stray cat taken in by Dalai Lama. With its simple fictional approach, it made me understand the teachings of Buddhism. This, coupled with the discovery of yoga a few years ago, it suddenly all became clear. We are the light and the light is within us all. There is no distinction between class, race, nationality, or even inherited religious belief systems. Through my conversations with many, I often felt the need to search for information, become more learned, qualify and quantify my theories and beliefs in order to come from a place of knowing. It's funny again, our social norms have led us to believe that unless you have studied something, you're allowed to believe and be vocal about these beliefs. This, however, could not be further from the truth. It's possibly through the practice of mindfulness, meditation, yoga, or just simply being present in every moment of every day that we get to master the connection with self. According to the Heart Sutra, quote, the insight that brings us to the other shore, unquote. Ali Buddhas in the past, present and future, by practicing the insight that brings us to the other shore, all are capable of, attain of attaining authentic and perfect enlightenment. We all have the seed within us. With the right conditions, we all have the ability to make it grow. There is no time frame. It could take time or it could come in an instant. Simply put, one of my favorites is, you know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. With the simple knowledge of just knowing, embracing it and allowing the flow, enlightenment can come to those that have the ability to quote teachings, poems, philosophers, or perhaps like me, just knowing and embracing it. Welcome it, welcoming it and allowing the connection with self to show me the way. Through the connectedness of self, Trust, faith, and love have the ability to come so easily and bring a person so much closer to enlightenment. And with this mindfulness, breathing and walking, we learn to become Buddha, and Buddha learns to become us. The seed within us all has the ability to grow into a beautiful flower, or wither if not taken care of properly. With the right positive elements and conditions like food, water, and it has the ability to grow into a beautiful flower or with negative elements wither away. With balance in the middle path, the perfect conditions is inevitably will flourish. Buddha said, nothing survives without food. In October 2008, I found myself filing for divorce with two young children and hadn't really worked for seven years. After taking up a temporary position as office clerk in a laundromat that washed linen for government hospitals, I started earning a small living for myself and children. Five months later, I was presented with the opportunity to become a business owner, a 
small corporate travel agency with two other partners grabbing it i began my journey back to the travel industry after being away for a very long time everything had changed with the internet and new technology, it was like learning to ride a bike all over again. Of course, with my voice and the ability to face any challenge given to me, I was able to eventually become the sole owner, doubling the size of the business in a few short years. By doing so, I realized that with the ability to be good at something, travel, and with the passion for something, yoga, I could combine the two and so we move active was created an online platform that would have the ability to link all in wellness through a sense of community and travel the purpose of this digression is that life is about finding your hunger as we know buddha said nothing survives without food food however can come in many many forms food food that which we eat nourishing us physically the edible food then soul food, that which does not feed us nutritionally, feeding the soul. And when we feed the soul, we nourish the love. Soul food has three parts. Sensory food, smell, hear, taste, feel and touch. Volition, that which motivates and fuels us. And consciousness, our individual, collective and environmental consciousness. Closing, when you have the ability to combine that which you are good at, providing the edible food that, and that which you have passion for, soul food, combining, coming from the pure intent of love, from a point of middle ground with balance, the ability to achieve great things, not only for ourselves, but for all others. Shine your light, find your hunger, most of all, with pure intention, full of love and middle ground. Connect with self, its manifestation, a culmination of many causes and conditions with awareness. Gone, 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 all the way over. Buddha has gifted us with the present of being present. Namaste. Thank you, Ms. Paula Martini, for sharing your life's journey with us. We shall now have flute music by Mr. Sham Krishna with Ms. James. Introduction. From his youth, Sham has been avidly being absorbed in classical Indian artistry. His passion for traditional mediums such as the flute and harmonium and classical singing has driven his desire to promote his rich heritage. Sham is a student of Sri Nitriya and Guru Manesh Maharaj. A little introduction of uh, Mr. Shane Kupisami on keyboard. Shane Kupisami is also a vocalist and a multi-talented musician. Shane also infuses jazz and Afro pop music into his style of classical Hindustani and Carnatic music. For the past 20 years, Shane has started, he shared his talent with various artists locally and abroad.
thank you to Mr. Sham Krishna and Mr. Shane Kupasami for that beautiful soothing music. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Kojo Satu from Japan. Dr. Kojo Satu obtained his PhD in Sanskrit at the University of Pune in Pune, India in the year 2003. Thereafter, in 2001, he obtained his Doctorate of Literature at the Otani University, Kyoto, Japan. Dr. Sato is the head priest of the Furki Jain Temple, Zen Buddhist Temple, Shiga, Japan, from 2007 to present. He is currently the president of the Markacharan, the Vidyavana by Kojo Sato, and Chiku Akari, the private school of Turkizan, Furki Jain Temple, the Rinzan sect of Zen Buddhism, from 1983 to present. Dr. Satu was a full-time lecturer at the Toho Academy, the Narkamura Hajime Eastern Institute from 2004 to 2015 in Tokyo, Japan. He was a research fellow at the Namkura Hajime Eastern Institute from 1997 to 2014, Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Satu was a member of the researchers of the Grants in Aid for Scientific Research, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science in 2002 and 2004. Thereafter from 2007 to 2009, and thereafter from 2013 to 2019, he is the Affiliated Academic Society of the Japanese Association of Indian and Buddhist Studies, Association for the Study of History of Indian Thought, Chokai Association Indian and Buddhist Studies, the Society for Jaina Studies, Japanese Association for Religious Studies, the Western Japanese Association of India and Buddhist Studies, Hiroshima University, Kyushu University. Thank you, Dr. Goju Sato. So much. Namaskar. Namaste. Hello. I'm Goju Sato, a Zen Buddhist priest at Fukujin Temple, Shiga, Japan. Yes. And my main subject is Indian thought, uh, that is to say, darshana in Sanskrit, uh, especially logic and epistemology. Today, so I am very, very happy to have so nice and precious opportunity in celebration of Buddha's Purunima. So my special many thanks are due to doc Dr. Yogi Sensei and sirs and madams or staff at the center. Thank you so much today. Uh, so my English is very poor, so please forgive me. And but so I'd like to show the process and experience uh, up to the Kensho, that is to say Nirvana uh, Moksha in India. So Dr. Yogi Sensei suggested and advised me. So. I will try. Yes. And uh, so, may I use uh, this time? So, uh, I'd like to use my uh, some slide paper uh, with you or can I? Yes. So, let's have a journey to uh, Zen Buddhist. Okay. Invocation of eternal light on the wisdom called and I want to show my memory in Pune, so that the words of my Guruji, uh, Basran Ranza, he said to me, Sato Subramanichan, everything is of momentariness, don't hurry, you learn everything slowly, slowly. And if you do so, you can do everything. There are many objections to every theory, but it's a difference of just expression, sato. The most important thing is not to reject other theory, but to know tattoo. Sato, in this world being constantly changing, what you have to achieve is to know tattoo, and then to be the knowledge itself all the time. 
this is what you have to do as a yogini. This is uh, the real fundamental principle of Indian thought given to me by my Guruji, Professor Vasantan Ranza, has guided me onto Darshan as Guru Shishya hmm, Parampara passed from generation to generation by oral tradition from ancient time in India, as you know. The tattoo refers to the idea Swabha, that is to say, it is an essential or inherent property, which is the cause makes the object clearly itself, or the very thing. We can call it Dharma, Guna, Vishashan, Prakara, and so on, that is to say, Samaya or Jati. Today, so uh, let's journey to this mm, chat. What is Kensho? It's just like Nirvana in Zen Buddhism. What is passing Tatua? And what is practicing Zazen? And what is Tatua? And what is is so, process of uh, practicing Zazen. This is the uh, um, same point uh, today. Yes. And uh, first, the idea of tattoo in general. It is deadness, uh, which is causes the phenomenal world or the existence to be it, that itself. We can regard the idea of Svabhava as similar to that of Tatua. It is, for example, Gotua, which causes the existence called Go. We usually recognize to be it, that it is as Go, it's a cow. And furthermore, we can see the Sata being this as the highest universal that can be equivalent to the idea of Brahman in the Vedanta school, as is well known, and so on. Yeah. But what is Tatua? The realist, of course, uh, the realist of Indian, Indian philosophy. The realist accepts it as an eternal universal existence in this world. So in our experience. The idealist in India accept it as uh, just a conception, just a conception. Hmm. In ancient India, the Tatua or Svodahab is grammatically regarded as the Shabda Prabhupada Nibita. And in Mahayana Buddhism, it is done, that is to say, uh, regarded as the Prapancha, the expansion of words or the Kalpana. And so let's say Darshana, so as you know, but in relation to the idea of Tatua, we can see the idea of perception called Darshana that makes the structure of cognition, uh, making the phenomenal world where we exist clear. Yes, Darshana makes it clear. It's a kind of mm, in other words, it means that the darshana can help us to know whether in this world they are exist. And outside or in the world, the real agent aham as the real culture or not. So aham is a real or unreal. Yes. In this way, the perception darshana is a means of acquiring prima or certain knowledge which makes us know the world itself without contradiction with our empirical knowledge so with it, uh, our experience and then so the topic of the buddhism this is uh, very important who am i yes uh, we may say it, uh -huh. uh, it is equal to where is here, 
Yes, here is this word. The topic refers to the following. Who does perceive what? This means character, career, and karma. There are uh, among them, so there are some other relationships. Who is doer? Who is the action? Sorry, what is the action? What is the object? Yes, what is the relationship among them? This topic is very important of Zen Buddhism. And uh, next, so um, we have to touch on the purpose of Zen Buddhism. The purpose is to perceive and realize that the Nirvana or Moksha is just only the condition of the mind, Chitta, Buddhi, and so on. It's released from the mundane bondage, attachment to this world, and free from setting the mind on the idea considering whether the existence is of Anitetua or Anitetua. Sorry, Anitetua or Anitetua. This perceiving the generates to the knowledge. The I, Aham, is just only an illusion produced by the mind, Chitta Buddhi. That is to say, Asmita and so on. So we may say it uh, a kind of ego. The knowledge does refer to the wisdom called Pragya. Yes, it's a Vidya, we can say. And but uh, so we have to do an attention to this month. It is this knowledge, the pragya is true or real. This is also very important. The answer is no mm. on the Buddhism because the knowledge, the pragya is also an illusion which is just distinguished by a delimiter or vishishan, it's a color here. It uh, does refer to the jnana, uh, we call it vishishta jnana. The vishishta jnana is produced by the idea vishishana vishishya bhava. In other words, it is done by the vishishana or tattva. In Zen Buddhism, we cannot determine whether the vishishana or tattva is real or unreal. So we cannot ontologically say anything about who I am and what the world is. This is a very important point. The perception and the condition, uh, we call it shunyata uh, in Japanese, so, uh, you know, so ku or kusho. Zen Buddhism clearly considers this phenomenal world rising in the sense of practice samatipada as shunyata. Where uh, we can see that the idea of Prakriti Samtapada or Shunyata does refer to the expressive condition, causing us to know that this phenomenal world is just the object which can be recognized only on the field of the expansion of words. Though so we cannot determine whether the object to be recognized does really exist in the outside or in the world or not. The shunyata is nothing but what? Cause, this is uh, the thing which causes this uh, someone to know it. Provision, a means of taking it to the field of the expansion of words. It's a kind of means or way, we call it upaya, uh, in Japanese, uh, hoben, which encourages us to realize that a human being cannot be what does exist beyond the field of expansion of words. This is also very, very important. The idea of uh, shunyata, so we have to touch. The shunyata, it is uh, the linguistic, uh, linguistic representation of or a kind of means in order to realize that the process of the perception of our empirical world lies just under the condition of Nisbaba. 
or the complete lack of the occasioning gland for the use of the word. It is Shabda uh, Prabhupada Nimitta. This idea of Shinyata as a criterion for perceiving our empirical world is fundamentally different from the realist idea of Nastitu regarded as permanent cause existing in the universe, which makes the non existent, uh, for example, above itself, in real existence. When Zen Buddhists, on our theory, touch on the means of perceiving our empirical world, we invariably use the grammatical expression, shunyataya, that is to say, in the sense of the locative case in Sanskrit. Of course, it is very clear. Then Buddhists adopt uh, the standpoint that the idea of Pratiti Samtpada does refer to a condition of the perception of our empirical world, that is to say, under the condition of the Nisvabha. Just like Nagarjuna's idea, we call this idea just Ku or Mu. Uh, this is called the condition of the mind, Nirvana or Moksha. That is to say, we may say uh, it Kensho. So in Buddhism, the Shunyata is not the ontological matter, never. And so, we practicing uh, called uh, practicing zazen. Uh, it's a kind of sadhana, so the reading. The murder or sadhana of Zen Buddhism up to the Kensho, this idea, so Amoksha, Nirvana, and Indian philosophy. Uh, we practice uh, zazen. Zazen means or the method in order to realize I and this world. Zazen, it is equivalent to the idea of Ashtanga, the eight parts of concentration and the system of yoga, uh, as you know. So uh, this sutra is very famous. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhyo, Asta, Angani. This is uh, from the Yoga Sutra. Zazen and Sanyama. So, uh, as I said, Zazen is equivalent to the idea of Sanyama. Sanyama, it is uh, concentration of mind and system of yoga. Uh, but uh, we have to uh, so give our attention to this point. The term Sanyama is a kind of a technical term of three kinds. Uh, it is uh, the following. So, one is dharana, and next dhyana, and samadhi. Mm. It's uh, referred to causing the mind to fall from. Yes, it is. This is dharana. Dhyana mm, does refer to dwelling upon to think of a thing. And samadhi uh, does refer to enlightening the object along the void of its own identity as it were. Yes. Practicing Zazen. Uh, so practicing the Yama and Yama so, uh, is a matter of course. And so next point is very important. It is uh, three kinds. Regulating the body, asana. First, I practice uh, on Zazen. Regulating the body, it does refer to asana. And regulating the breath, it does refer to pranayama. And last, regulating the mind, pratyahara and sanyama. Of course, sanyama is of two kinds, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. But in practicing zazen, we cannot divide the process of one, two, three above. It's not too much to say that the sanyama with the asana, mm, prayanama, mm, pratyahara, mm, and sanyama. 
must especially practice at the same time the same time not the process it must be done at the same time this is also very important time afterwards on the ground of the samadhi by means of darshana or on con on the condition of the mind shunyatayam we can realize who am i it's equal to where is here this is what what is it so the topic who does passive what who is the doer what is the action what is the object what is the relationship among them so we can conclude uh, partly it is an illusion Korea is also an illusion Karma is also an illusion Sambanda is all of course is an illusion according to the above automatically uh, we can realize this our empirical world ahem it is serve it is look it's an illusion yes this is very important then buddhism reveals we may say that this darshana leads us to penetrating the process of creating creating the cause uh, and real culture of the condition of the mind dukkha dukkha so it's a suffering uh, developing as the effect we have although we cannot get rid of the process as long as we are alive in this empirical world this refers to the fact that a human being cannot be what does exist beyond the period of the expansion of words and our experience so it is this is what uh, this world is just nothing but what is limited to the uh, fictitious and unreal ourselves maybe we can call this knowledge for the wisdom pleasure based on darshana and this condition of the mind does refer to Kensho in Zen Buddhism. Yes. And last, so if possible, let's uh, touch on the Siddhartha's word. I love these uh, sentences because um, they are very, very beautiful. So this is quoted from the Dhammapada. Uh, number is 153 and 154. Mm. So, looking for the maker of this tabernacle, I shall have to learn through a course of many birds, so long as I do not find him. And painful is birds again and again. But now, maker of the tabernacle, thou hast been seen. So shall not make up this tabernacle uh, again. All the little, uh, all the lectures are broken. The rich pool is sundered. The mind approaching the eternal. Yes, it's a nirvana. Has attained to the extinction of all desires. Uh, so my english is very poor so please forgive me but uh, so now i am very very happy to have this precious opportunity uh, in celebration of buddha's burden today so i'm very happy thank you so much dr yogi sensei uh, and says and moderns all staff at the center thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Kaju Soto, and for taking time of your busy schedule to enlighten us. We now have a song by Ms. Kavita Solanki. She's a teacher of Indian culture at the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center. Thank you, Cheryl Ji. Star, everyone. Enjoy the beautiful song. Divya Dhiya 
दया की ओर तपस्वी जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है सज धज कर आवे आकर्षण पग पग पर झूमते प्रलोभन होकर सबसे विमुख बटो ही होकर सबसे विमुख बटो ही पथ पर संभल संभल चलता है दिव्य ध्येय की ओर तपस्वी जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है अमर तत्व की अमित साधना प्राणों में उसर्ग कामना जीवन का शाश्वत व्रत लेकर जीवन का शाश्वत व्रत लेकर साधक हस कण कण गलता है दिव्य ध्येय की ओर तपस्वी जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है सफल विफल और आशा निराशा इनकी और कहा जी ग्यासा बी हड़ता मेरा बनाता बी हड़ता मेरा बनाता राही मचल मचल चलता है दिव्य ध्येय की ओर तपस्वी जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है पतझड़ के झंझावा तो में जग के घातों प्रतिघातों में सुर भी लुटाता सुमन सिहरता सुर भी लुटाता सुमन सिहरता निर्जनता में भी खिलता है दिव्य ध्येय की ओर तपस्वी जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है जीवन भर अभी चल चलता है थैंक यू धन्यवाद Thank you, Miss Savita, for that beautiful song. Now we will have concluding remarks by Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Director Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center. Sir, respected Dr. Guru Sato Sinse. हरी भाई जी ओजा मार्टिनी जी शरील जी शिष्टी जी कविता जी ऑल डिस्टिंग्विश ऑनलाइन गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन एंड आवर ऑनलाइन कोलोबरेटर श्री पीयूष खंडेलवाल जी वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट बुद्धा was not uh, interested in talking more he was only giving the message to humanity to be silent and today when we are discussing about topic invocation of eternal light and what we have discussed uh, in our discussion to our panelists we are observing that there is a light which is eternal which is which is not to be destroyed which is not to be disappeared which is not to be eliminated this 
truth is always here around us and within us so why we are not feeling that light within us which is eternal why we are not able to get that light within us why we are not experiencing this light why we are feeling that every time we are surrounded from darkness what is the problem before the humanity and human beings consciousness that we are always away from this light which is eternal when i am uh, experiencing this process of observing the light with all of you then i am feeling spontaneously naturally freshly that it is only our weakness to see the light see the light which is eternal because we have closed our eyes we are not able to see at that side where the light is present always the light is always present within us but we are not able to invoke it because we are so much obsessed to be in the darkness we are feeling that darkness is the synonym to the life which is considered as worldly life which is considered as practical life which is con considered as empirical life so we need to go always to the darkness rather than searching or experiencing the light which is eternal when we are feeling that without selfishness without greed without fear without desire without competition without comparison and without criticism we cannot survive because these are the necessities of our practical life we are totally habitual and obsessed to be into that kind of things which are another name of darkness which are another name of that illusion which is always between us and the light and that illusion like if uh, something covering the water then we are not able to see the water so it is like a curtain which is between us and that eternal light so how can we invoke the light which is eternal we can only invoke the light eternal by uncovering that curtain and what is that curtain that curtain is ego that curtain is exclusion that curtain is which is giving us the sense of personal security the exclusive luxury exclusive convenience exclusive comfort which is not at all possible no exclusivity exclusivity is possible in this world it is only the perception and illusion and that illusion is our ego we are feeling that we can save ourselves we can nourish ourselves we can make ourselves important than others we can make ourselves forward than others we can live without getting any connectivity with others we are really exclusively important in this world is only the illusion comes from ego we are not at all important exclusively if we are important then we are important only as the part of the divinity which is eternal we are only having that capacity to be reflected from that light always so light is there we can feel it any time we can observe it any time we can experience it any time we can explore it any time we can invoke it any time 
only because of our tendency to go to darkness is making us unable to invoke or evoke it and that tendency is only because of, of our ego and that ego that curtain has become the big curtain like iron curtain but it is not iron curtain it is very small curtain very thin curtain very minor curtain it is only based on our perception and our borrowed sense of information and borrowed sense of life which is based on repetition and imitation always we are not able to go into originality because of the tendency to be imitative and to be uniform to others we are not able to realize the uniqueness within us which is making us always the part of that eternal light and the light is coming to us light is always giving us capacity to be lightened to be illuminated to be shining we need to only remove that curtain we need to only feel that that curtain is unnecessary why we are feeling that i am my i am myself is very important myself is exclusively privileged and my self should be privileged and my should myself should be forward to others and i can make myself very important and exclusively important person by competing with others by comparing with others by criticizing others by demeaning others by stopping others from their path so that is the sense which we have got from the illusionary life that illusionary life is a big barrier big obstacle obstacle between us and light you have the light in your house but a big curtain is there then how can you be illuminated how can you be lightened so that curtain can be removed first and that curtain can be removed only by realizing that the sense of exclusivity or ego is unnecessary and futile the futility of ego is only the power which can make us able to invoke that light when we are realizing the futility of ego at the same time simultaneously spontaneously we can be able to get that light without any hesitation and barrier like today in this program when we are talking to each other without having any physical connectivity but then we are feeling that connectivity through that energy because we are uncovering our ego while we are listening each other while we are understanding each other while we are contemplating the sense which is not to be segregated and separated so at the level of that understanding and that sense of oneness we are feeling that light because no darkness is there which can separate us which can give us sense of exclusivity and in that sense invocation of that eternal light is very easy thing the difficult thing is only to not to get that light directly and by being in the desires being in the ego being in the ex in the exclusivity we are doing that hard work every day every moment the hard work we are doing to be in the thought which which is making us separated the easy thing is not to be in the thought which is making us separated the easy thing is to being connected to each other the hard thing is to being separated to each other so invocation of light is very easy and a smooth thing in the life only difficult thing is not to being 
connected to the light and not to being able to invoke that light within. When we can make ourselves free from effort, free from obsession of doing something, free from making forward us from others, then we can get the direct connectivity. We can get that capacity to invoke that light. And in that sense, Buddha gave us an example by his own life that why you are doing the hard work for the illusionary thing. You need to come on the simple way. So Zazen is also a simple way. Uh, Sato Sensei, Zazen is only sitting, just sitting. You must sit down. You must be simple. You must be with yourself. This, you must be original. You must remove, you must leave all artificialities which are covering you from outside. You can feel that outside things are only made for the playfulness of this life, for the entertainment of this world. These are not real. So we can leave them as we cannot sleep with the entertainment. We cannot be relaxed with the entertainment. We cannot be simple and original with the entertainment. We need to leave that entertainment of this world, which is making us always separated in you and me. So when you will be make, we will be make, we will be able to make us away from that entertainment. We will be simply able to invoke that light within us. Thank you, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash, Swami Vivekananda, and the Cultural Center for sharing your wisdom with us. Now that we have come to the end of our program, we have Vote of Thanks by Ms. Shisti Hari Narayan. Thank you, Sherilji. Namaskar. On behalf of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India, Durban, it gives me great pleasure in thanking you all for today's program on the occasion of Put. Purnima. Firstly, I would like to thank Ms. Ragini Haribai, Ms. Paula Mittini, our guest speaker all the way from Japan, Dr. Kaju Sautu, uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues, Ms. Cheryl Banwarilal, Ms. Kavita Salanki, our director, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, our technical support, Mr. Piyush Kandalwal, most importantly, you, our online guest, for joining us today. Please stay at home, stay safe, and flash in the curve. Namaskar, Shubdev.